Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the study session that shall not be named here on Wednesday on YouTube and on Zoom. Welcome to Arlene and Flossie and Ron and Lou. Good morning, guys. We are so excited to be here. Welcome, everybody, on YouTube. We had our worship committee meeting last night with our cantor, so we're excited for her to start. Just got the updated thing for Israel. I'll be sending that out today, Lou, for you, anybody else interested, with some of the alterations we asked for. They actually put all of them in. And now we're going to... Yes, Ron. I'd like to mention to uh, every, everyone here that if you're going to be there on the for the 290th anniversary service and you want to stay for lunch, you've got to call the office to tell them that you're right. coming because they have limited seating. That's right. We've got our anniversary service a week from this Saturday. And as of now, we already have 125 RSVPs, which is a lot. I mean, me, you're 150 people, but not this many, so many RSVPs. That's pretty impressive. Rabbi, 126. I just went. All right, 126. And mm -hmm. I added Ava and Paul. So what, 127, 127. And let me tell you. Your uh, your uh, camera is much better now, Eva and Paul. You're on you're on mute, but your camera is looking good. It was so hazy for a while there. You know what? It was an operator error. There was a plastic over the camera. Oh, I was that what? <laughs> so it was operator error. Sorry, that's guys. awesome. That's just that's like are you good my are you related you, to me? <laughs> it's like taking forty seven pictures with the with the yeah. thing still yeah. on. Which I have done many times. Got some I'm really here, good black I'm, pictures. I'm here, but I'm gonna put the two ladies so you can see them. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're here to study. Nobody, uh, there wasn't anybody chose anything, so I decided we would go over uh, blessings in Judaism and talk about prayer in Judaism today. We haven't done that before. Trying to find, we've talked about so many things. So thought I'd pick a little bit of that. But first, uh, everybody doing okay? Yep. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is look at prayers in Judaism. And it's really important to understand when it comes to prayer, there's two parts to prayer according to Judaism. Something called the keva, which is the actual prayer. So it's the text. It's the prayer book. You open the prayer book and you've got prayers there. So that's the keva. And then there's the kavanah, which is the intention, the spiritual part, the connecting with God. So there's two parts. One part is really easy, and that is the keva, because it's easy to look at a text. Whether it's English or Hebrew, you can look at the text or you know the prayer. So that's really easy. Keva, you can have anywhere you want. The kavanah is the more difficult part because not everybody is in the mood to pray. And sometimes we're only in the mood to pray when we're seeing a mountain. Or So Judaism believes that the best way to pray is to have both, but acknowledging that we can't always have the spiritual part. And if we only do prayer when we have the spiritual part, it could be very infrequent. And so that's why the text is there to ensure that we do pray, that we say thank you to God, that we do com commit to our community, that we connect, even if we're not feeling it in our hearts. And then hopefully the more you pray, then the more you'll connect. So for those people who are very spiritual and connect very easily, um, it's easy to have the kavanah. For those of us who are not that gifted, then we need the, the, the keva, the prayers, to really get us to that level. And so what we're going to look at is how Judaism has decided to put these two into action. So I'm going to go on, share the screen, and we're going to look at the prayers for food. as just a good way to start. <clears throat> so the obvious way in which Judaism has decided to make sure the keva, the prayers are part of us, is to make the prayers very easy. Because most prayers start with the prayer formula. What is the prayer formula? 
Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. That is the prayer formula. Almost every Jewish prayer begins with or ends with those six words. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, eternal God, ruler of the universe. Although it says king of the universe here, I need to switch that. Let me go do that right now. So now if it's a commandment, then you add a shir kedishanu b'mitzvot tavitzivanu. Like if you're lighting the candles on a Friday night, it is a commandment to light the candles on Friday night. So you say baruch atad and elohim ma'achalam, and you add a shir kedishanu b'mitzvot tavitzivanu lahadlik ner shel shabbat. So if it's a commandment that must be done in the moment, you add that second part. Is eating bread? A commandment in the moment are you do you have to eat bread at a certain moment in time the answer is no no so it is not a commandment but we still say thank you to God so we say the first six words so for the food prayers they're really not commanded so, so they only see all the food prayers have six words you might say what about the wine well the wine is not required at a specific moment because you, you know you eat dinner whenever you eat dinner so now what's interesting is the food prayers are are really fun because there are six of them there's mm -hmm. the prayer for bread there's the okay. prayer for cookies cakes cereal cupcakes and donuts which is the one i seem to say six times a day for some reason yeah <laughs> There's a prayer for grape juice and wine. There's a fruit for, uh, prayer for fruits from trees, like apples. There's a prayer for vegetables and greens, basically fruits and things that come from the ground, which would include fruits like melons, but also things like peanuts. And then you have the prayer for candy, dairy, eggs, fish, liquid, meat, mushrooms as well. So you have six prayers. So the question is, which one do you say at which time when you're eating? Because let's say I'm having some wine and I'm having a hamburger, which has meat and bread. I'm having some cupcakes for dessert. I'm having some, you know, peanuts in my salad. And of course, some oranges in my salad. So I could literally say all six prayers at one time. Is that what you do? The answer is no, except for Passover, for the Seder, that's not what you do. So this is how the prayers for food works beforehand. So before eating, it's a short prayer because you're hungry. After eating, when you're satiated, there's a longer series of prayers you say. But before eating, if you are eating any type of bread, not cake, but bread, then all you need to do is say, Hamotzi lecha min haaretz, and that covers everything. Mm -hmm. So if you're having a steak and a little bit, a little biscuit, then you would still say the prayer for bread because you got the biscuit. So if you say the prayer for bread, it covers everything. The other prayers you only say if you are not eating bread. Now the exception is for wine and grape juice. <clears throat> This prayer is only a ritual prayer. So you might say, well, there's a prayer for grapes and a prayer for grape juice. It doesn't make sense. Well, the prayer for grape juice and wine is only when you're doing like Friday night or Friday afternoon or a holiday. It's only for the official prayer of having a celebration. So the prayer, the wine grape thing is a separate thing. If I'm having just cookies for lunch, as I often do, then I would just say, Bore, me name is Onot, who creates various kinds of, of other types of foods. So if I'm just having cupcakes, that's all. But if I'm having cupcakes for dessert and I had a hamburger for dinner, then I don't need to say the prayer for cupcakes because I said Hamotzi. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm eating just an apple but nothing else, then I will say, Bore pre heights creates fruit of the tree. If I'm having a banana, which is very frequent because that's what I have for breakfast, then I just say Bore pre haadama, who creates fruit from the earth. 
Where it gets confusing is where you have a big meal that doesn't have bread. Let's say I have steak and potato and a big salad and a giant apple, but I have no bread. I only need to say one prayer. So you pick what is the main ingredient, main food you're eating. If I'm eating steak, that is obviously probably the main one. So I go to the bottom one, which is basically for everything that's not already listed. So if the, but if my main, if I'm having, you know, um, a baked potato with little ground pieces of beef, I might say bore prihadama because the potato is the main part of the meal. So it's really going to be what do you consider the main part of the meal if you don't have bread? If you have bread, it's easy. If you don't have bread, then you kind of have to figure out what's best for that particular meal. Most of the time, people will say shakoni yebid baro because it covers so many things, unless you're having like a snack or just specifically one of these other things. So is that clear to everybody or did I make it more confusing? All right, so yeah. six prayers for meals. You only need to say one. Usually it's gonna be mozi. So like at my camp where I went uh, growing up and then where I was a counselor, it's a more, it's a, not a concern, it's a, a young Judea camp. It's a, so it's more, they keep kosher rules there. And it's a Shomer Shabbos camp. So on Friday night, we'd have a big meal. On Saturday, before Habdallah, we'd have a big meal and we'd have a big lunch. So for breakfast, what did we have? We had, we had donuts, we had cakes, like coffee cakes and fruit, but we did not have any bread for Saturday morning, why? because there's a belief that you only have three meals on Shabbat. And if you have Friday night, Saturday night before Havdalah and lunch, that is three meals. So for breakfast, we didn't have a meal. And what does it mean not to have a meal? What food do you have to have to say it's an actual meal? You have to have bread, exactly, Lou. To have a meal, an official meal, it has to have bread, not coffee cake, but bread. So for breakfast, we had coffee cake and there was no bread of any kind. And that was, that's just how the law works. Because if you gonna, so, because a lot of times for Shabbat, you'll have Friday night, Saturday night, and lunch, and then you'll have Havdalah and you'll have dinner after Havdalah. But in the summer, Havdalah is not till 9.30 at night and you got all these kids and you're not going, or 8.30 at night, you're not going to let them wait till that long. So, so those are the prayers for the meal. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right. What you should be questioning is why does your rabbi eat cookies for lunch so often? That should be something you should be scolding me for. Other prayers of these prayers are used ritually at times as well, but not as often. We say, Baruch HaTad and I, Elhinu Mal Chalam Barei Pri Ha'etz. Blessed are you, eternal God, sovereign of the universe, who creates the fruit of the tree when we have apples and honey for Rosh Hashanah. So even though you may have a meal, you want to say this prayer at some point. The only time you say a lot of them, though, is for Passover. That's kind of like an exception to the rules because you say for all these type things. So these are prayers. So there's lots of prayers for just the world. Like I see a rainbow, I say Baruch Atanai Elohim Malchalam, and then something about the rainbow. If I want to go traveling or celebrate, I say Baruch Atanai Elohim Malchalam, and the prayer for celebration or the prayer for travel. All oh, Rabbi. Right. Yes, Ron. Well. Oh. Take Passover, where you have a variety of, uh, of everything. Well, you don't have bread, but you have matzah. Uh, what prayer do you, would you say for matzah? Exactly. So Passover is the exception because you say the prayer for fruit from the trees. You say the prayer for fruit from the ground. You say a separate prayer for matzah. And you say a prayer for bread. 
So you say all of these now, how do they get around this? Because remember, Judaism is a kind of a legislative law binding. So you have to keep the laws even when you're making exceptions. What they do for Passover is they make sure to do the bread prayer last. So you have snack, snack, matzah, then meal. Because if you say the prayer motzi first, you don't, don't get to say the other prayers because the motzi covers everything. So that's why in the Seder, you do the prayer for the fruit of the vine. I mean, prayer for fruit of the tree, prayer for fruit of the ground. You do the prayer for matzah, and then you do motzi. Because once motzi said, it covers everything. So it's kind of like going around the rules a little bit because usually I only need to say one. But, you know, that's just the way it works. It makes it more fun. So that's how they do it for Passover. So for Passover, you will say the prayer. You only say the prayer for matzah during Passover. Once Passover's over, you don't say it. You say, you can, you'll say, if you have matzah, you just say the prayer over the bread. Mm. That just makes, you know, that's kind of the rule. So it's kind of cool. Now, that's how it works for um, for food. food or for any other blessings. Now, let's go through more some of the texts that talk about the meaning behind it. So, right here. We see some thoughts on prayer. So this first one right here from Deuteronomy, because in the actual Torah, there's not that many prayers. So here we say, for the eternal your God brings you into a good land, a land of brooks of waters, I got trans translation one day, of fountains and depths, springs, valleys, and hills, a land of wheat and barley, vines, figs, pomegranates, olive trees, honey, a land wherein you will eat bread without scarceness. You won't lack anything. A land whose stones are iron and whose hills are that you will be able to dig brass. And you will eat and be satisfied and bless the eternal, your God, for the good land God has given you. So this prayer, this is important because it gives us this kind of a basic bless the eternal. Our God. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Baruch Atah Adonai, blessed are you, eternal God. So we see that phrase right here, which mm -hmm. is used as the basis for you need to say this prayer. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech So we do see that general idea of this prayer beginning in the Torah. In the Torah, there's one real prayer. And that is the priestly benediction, which does not have Baruch HaTad That is, may the Lord protect and defend you. May God always keep you from shame. You know, may God give you peace. So that's an actual prayer in the Torah. So that's pretty the oldest prayer we have. The other prayer in the Torah is the prayer we do use in services. That is the exception to the rule. The prayer that is the main exception to the rule is Shema. Shema does not have the first six words that we usually use. It's Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Elohim, and Ayachad. It's six different words. That is a rarity. The prayer right afterwards, Ve'ahavta, then goes right into Baruch Adonai. But the Shema is considered a prayer even though it is not have the formula, just as the priestly benediction. Those are two of the exceptions to the rules. Most of the time, prayers will have... The idea is it connects everybody, that all Jews can say this prayer formula. That even if you're not feeling like praying, you still should pray. I, I don't, I'm not especially appreciative to God for the meal I'm supposed to have. I'm having, you know, a white bread and bologna sandwich with mayonnaise because I was in a rush. I'm not really looking forward to it. By the way, it is kosher bologna. Not looking forward to it. I'm only doing it for sustenance. But I still say the prayer to say thank you to God for giving this to me, even though I'm not having sushi, which is what I'd prefer to have. So that's what those prayers are there for. They're there to make sure we show appreciation, 
especially when we don't have it. All right, does anybody want to read this section from the Talmud? Um, right here. Can you see it? No, it's too small. Too small? How's that? <clears throat> yeah, I can read that. Because of my amazing talents as a computer hacker, I was able to enlarge it. <laughs> you want me to start? Yeah, from where do we derive? From where do we derive the principle of reciting a blessing before partaking of food? We infer it is from the more lenient case. If a person is obligated to recite a blessing when he is full, all the more ought he do so when he is hungry. Actually, even without a logical argument, it is reasonable to suppose that it is forbidden, forbidden for a person to derive any benefit from this world without first reciting a blessing. Our rabbis taught, it is forbidden for a person to derive benefit from this world without first reciting a blessing. And whoever derives benefit from this world without first reciting a blessing is guilty of embezzlement. Rabbi Levy contrasted two verses. On the one hand, scriptures says that the earth and all that is that it contains are God's from Psalm 24.1, but on the Ron, you froze there for a bit. And scripture says that this, however, is not a contradiction. The first verse speaks of the situation prior to the recitation of a blessing. And the second speaks of the situation after a blessing has been recited. All right. So it's a little confusing. But it basically says, if we're getting something from God like food, we should be especially appreciative. But there's two issues with eating food. Should we say really a blessing before we eat or after we eat? And the answer is both. We should say a blessing when we are hungry because obviously we're going to say a blessing we're hungry because we're desperate to eat. But we should also say something when we're, we're satiated because that makes it more essential. It's so easy to say a prayer when I'm starving. Give me food. I need food. Let me be appreciative. But once I'm full, I might say, ah, I don't, I'm not, I don't care that much about it anymore. I'm, it's not in my forefront of my mind. So that's why you say the prayer beforehand, which is short because we want to eat. We're hungry. And the second prayer afterwards is longer because we're satiated. And it's like we're not in a rush to eat. So this is why eating is so important because we all have to do it. All human beings have to do it. And we do it every day. And it's very easy to lose appreciation of it for those of us who are not, you know, having difficulty getting food. So, so like basically, um, yes. Lost. The way you're making it, how the prayer for bread is so important. On Yom Kippur, when we fast, after the fast, is the first prayer a prayer for bread? Do we break our fast usually with the bread? Yes. I mean, we sometimes do it with wine as well, but that is not required. Yes, the bread is the most important one. And that brings a good point to bear now. According to how the prayer usually works, is you usually say a prayer and then do something. Oh, Rabbi. Yes, Ron. Um, on Saturday, when you do the prayer over the wine and the bread at the end of the service, mm -hmm. which should really come first? The wine comes first and then the bread. Just for ritual purposes. And that would count Shabbat evening and Shabbat afternoon meal usually but the prayer for the wine is not as essential because it really it's only necessitated uh during holidays and twice on shabbat so but what is 
a good point is also, that's a great question, but also whenever we say a prayer, we do the action afterwards. We say the prayer for eating, and then we eat. We say the prayer for drinking, then we drink. So when it's an action, you say the prayer first. Like if you're pr saying a prayer for celebration, you're not going into an action. So you can sell, you say it, but there's exceptions to the rule. One of the exceptions and the main exception to this rule is lighting the candles for Shabbat. Because you're not supposed to light candles on Shabbat, when you light the candles, it's kind of like I'm lighting the candles before I say the prayer, so it's before Shabbat. So traditionally, you light the candles, and then you do this to kind of like pretend like you haven't done it, and then you say the prayer. It's almost like once you say the prayer, it is now Shabbat, so you can't light the candles because we just started Shabbat. And you can't light candles on Shabbat. You have to light candles right before Shabbat again. So it's again, it's kind of a legal fiction. Um, but that's just traditionally. Everybody does it their own way in practicality, but that's the reason you see people do this and the reason why the candles are lit often before the prayer is said. Okay, let's see. Now here, what we see from Rose Goldstein, A Time to Pray, is an explanation of the meaning for each of the prayers. Baruch, to say thank you. Ata, so this is something I can send out to each of you, going through each word and what it means to her. Mm -hmm. All right. Is it different for the meaning for somebody else? This is just her? But... That's for her, yeah, exactly. When we go up, to, if we have time, but I want to read this from Marsha Falk. She is probably one of the two most important Jewish female liturgists um, and really brought the idea of bringing prayer into a different venue. Because in Judaism, in Hebrew, Hebrew is a gender-based language. So in English, if I say chair, it's not male or female. It's just a chair. If I say phone, it's only female if I say a person's name or a woman. That's a woman or women are female. That's not how it works in Hebrew. In Hebrew, everything is gender. If mm -hmm. I say you, hey you, it's a different word for a woman than a man. For a man, I would say ata. For a woman, I would say ot. So even the word you has a gender to it. Every item has a gender. A table has a gender. So that means when you are creating prayer, when prayer was created, it ended up being very masculine. Because there's no way to do a gender neutral prayer. Because if I say blessed are you, Blessed are and you are all individually male. Baruch is a male. Blessed in a masculine. Baruch ata. Ata is you in masculine. Yes. Eloheinu is our God in masculine. Melech is king, which obviously is masculine. We say eternal, but it's actually king. Baruch atanai, Adonai is a don which actually means Ten. male master basically mm. haolam means the world in masculine terms so every prayer we say is in the masculine because it's a gender language and it was in the probably 80s that people started saying way well, we need to figure out ways to change this we could do it in the translation Obviously, if we translate it to English, it's a lot easier to make it gender neutral because blessed are you is not is gender neutral in English. So once you make the translation, you can change everything. I can say, you know, eternal instead of Lord. Because Lord, I can say ruler instead of king. It's very simple. In Hebrew, not so much so. So Marsha Falk and one of my professors, Rachel Adler, were two of the women who really were at the forefront of this discussion. So does anybody want to read this by Dr. Marsha Falk? 
Well, I can do that. All right, Ron, you want me to increase it for you? Yeah. I was already increased. No, it? It's already been. Okay, good. Um, it says a rabbinic invention. Yes. <clears throat> a rabbinic invention based on a biblical form, the traditional blessing is a statement consisting of two parts, an opening clause declaring God blessed and a content specific fr uh, phrase or phrases relating this declaration to the occasion being marked. In the latter half of the Baruch. And that means prayer, in the latter half of the prayer. Yes. The rabbis have explored a variety of life experiences. The first half, in contrast, is a formula, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the world. Of course, the heavily patriarchal imagery of the rabbinic formula makes it particularly problematic. Yet, it is not a satisfying solution merely to replace the direct address of the Lord God King with the dress of a female image or images as Baruch HaTor Shimkachoa. Blessed, blessed are you, Shekiana. One proposal that has circulated widely is alter in alternative liturgies. Okay, we're going to pause right there for a second, Wrong. What she's saying here is the prayers are masculine. We can change that. We can say instead of blessed are you male, we can say blessed are you female. Shechina means God is a, is a name of God, but it's a female name of God. So basically oh. she's saying brucha at shechina. Blessed oh. are you God, but on female. But she's saying if we do this, we're doing the exact same thing. We're just switching it from male to female, but it's still gender based. She's saying there's a problem there making it gender based. So if you continue where it says while, Ron. Yeah, yeah. Well, one question. Sure. Uh, if you are at a Women of Mikveh Israel luncheon, what prayer would you, how would you say it? Uh, that's an excellent, and that's a really interesting question. This is how Hebrew works. There's feminine and masculine singular, and there's feminine and masculine plural. So if I'm in a room with just men, it's feminine, it's masculine plural. If I'm in a room with just women, it is feminine plural. That's very easy. What happens if there's men and women in a room? Do I use the masculine? Let's say there's 100 men and 10 women. Do I use the masculine plural or the feminine plural? Masculine. Use, let's say there's 100 women and 10 men. Do I use the masculine plural or the feminine plural? The answer is the Mas masculine plural. If there's a million women in one room, that's a big room, and one guy, Still not. Use the masculine. That's just how Hebrew works. So that's what she's saying. There's some issues here, as you can see. Um, so, uh, Ron, if you go to while it's refreshing. While it is refreshing to see images other than a single rabbinic icon, the retention of the formulation, blessed are you, has its own limitations. This passive construction is ultimately disempowering in that it masks the presence of the speaking self, whether personal or communal. That is performing the act of blessing. Perhaps most important, the statement, blessed are you, leaves the traditional view of God as other unchallenged. And the theology Theology is clearly problematic for many Jews today. Okay, we'll pause there. She's basically saying, if you say blessed are you in Hebrew, it's going to be problematic no matter what. Because you could say it in masculine tense or feminine tense. So either way, it is problematic, which uh, mm -hmm. is understandable. So... 
Uh, we go to the question of whether Jewish prayer needs to address God right here, Ron, where it says. I got it. Thank you. Perfect. Good cool. The question of whether Jewish prayer needs to address God as you is a highly charged one, perhaps even more provocative than the feminist challenge to the gender God. Vigorous protests arise when one question, the exclusive authority of the I-Thou address of divinity. There is a widely held assumption that this is the only legitimate mode for Jewish prayer. Okay, so we'll stay there. So basically what we're seeing here is she's saying, whenever you say God and you say you, you have to name God as a male or female. There's no other way in Hebrew. If I say you, God, in English, God is not masculine or, or feminine because you can be used for either. But if I say it any way in Hebrew, blessed are you, I am saying God is a man or a woman. And that is a problem. So from her perspective, it's something we need to deal with. Um, and, that is, and, and that is something <coughs> to think about. It's really hard to change thousands of years of Jewish tradition because we're all used to it. So what I often do for me, it's I, you know, for me, it's the changing of the translation. For her, it's changing the whole way Hebrew is done, which is very complicated. And so it's one of those things we have to deal with. Now, uh, Flossie. The prayer for Ben Shinglich, usually women say it, correct? There are certain prayers that only women say, yes. All right. So there we would have, with a woman saying it feminine, if there are no women around, can a man say it? Or he would not bench lift? Now, traditionally, probably not. But yes, today they probably would in the more modern world. Yeah. It depends on how you look at the prayers. There's, you know, women, the good thing about Judaism, and there's a lot of good things, is women were educated in Judaism. It's kind of ironic today. They're women in the ultra-Orthodox world that are not educated, when traditionally Jewish women were more educated than men in the outside world. They even had, there was even a set of specific, almost a set of language or poetry or um, Jewish texts that were just for women. That's almost a, almost a, almost a whole, just not a language, but a way of, of, of speaking. They're tchines. Uh, they were like uh, prayers and poems that women are only used by women. And it was like they had their own language almost, and so women, all women could read. So women were already, always, are always ahead of the game in Judaism in terms of, of, of uh, literacy. But when you get down to these specific issues of what we're talking about, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot of difficulties with the language that's gender neutral, not, not gender neutral. But yeah, there are certain prayers that are said by women, like traditionally women say uh, the prayer over the candles. Why do women say the prayer of the candles traditionally? Is it because men can't say it or women required to say it? The answer is because men are required to go to services. Women are not required to go to services. So on a Friday night, where is the husband? In the shul. At the shul while the wife is getting everything ready. So she may be saying it by herself even before he gets back if he's walking home. Um, so. But men can say the, pr the prayer over candles just like women can. There's nothing that says it's for women only, but it's just become part of the tradition. And what um, about the woman saying the bracha over the wine? Women can say any brachot, I think, except for the priest. Yeah, I'm not the priest, even, I think even a woman can say. Uh, so any woman can say the same thing. It's just become more traditional for a man because. Men have certain obligations and requirements that women don't. Women can go to services. Men are have to. required to go to services. Men are required to fulfill commandments. Women are not necessarily so if they're time-bound. Like saying uh, a, a prayer that is time-bound are not always required by women, but always required by men. So 
Um, that's why men, you know, have traditionally more said these prayers more often than women. Plus, what are the other issues? The other issues are Friday night and Saturday morning, if you have a bunch of kids and the father is required to go to services, what is the mother then doing? Take care of the kids. Take care of the kids, and that takes precedent over saying all these prayers and stuff. So uh, it is now obviously in the modern world, thank goodness, it is changing, and men are much more involved in the raising of the children. Uh, but traditionally, this is how it was done, not only in the Jewish world, but in all worlds, that the women raise the kids. In the Jewish world, I was very equal in terms of what was going on. The men went and prayed. The women cleaned the house, took care of the kids, and had a job. So it was pretty equal in what was going on. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so this is prayer, though, is still essential. So when we look at prayer <clears throat> in terms of the service, which is what we're most familiar with. You know, each service has a set structure to it every service traditionally it is three services a day four on shabbat every service has the pre-service which is the warm-up the main part of the service and the conclusion and sometimes you add the tour service so every service three times a day seven days a week and an extra service on shabbat you all have the pre-service the main service, the concluding service. And on Monday, Thursday, and Saturday morning, you would and Saturday afternoon, you'd also have the tour service. So everything has the prep, the main service, maybe a tour service, and then the finale. Now, the main parts to the service are the Shaman her blessings and the Amidah. So we know the Shema and blessings. It's the prayers that come before the Shema and after the Shema. Those are the Shema or blessings. That's one of the major sections. The other section is the Amidah. Baruch HaTanai Eloheinu, Elohei Avotainu Vimoteinu, Elohei Avraham, Elohei Tzach. So those are the two main prayers, two main prayer sections, the Shema and her blessings and the Amidah. However, even though, though they're the two main sections, only the Amidah is said at every service. So the prayer that goes, Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu, Belohei Avotainu Vimoteinu, Elohei Abraham, Blessed are you, eternal God, ruler of the universe, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Beth, Rachel. Only that prayer is said at every service. So if you are saying that prayer, it is a service. If you are not saying that prayer, it is a ceremony like a wedding, or if you don't say that prayer at a funeral, is a funeral a service? No, that's why you go to somebody's house after the funeral and you say that prayer, so you have the service at somebody's house. But a funeral is not a service. A wedding is not a service. A baby naming is not a service because you don't say this prayer. Mm. The prayer is called tefillah. What does tefillah mean? Prayer. You know the prayer is important if it's called the prayer. If a prayer is called the prayer, it's important. So that prayer is in every single service, all three during the weekday, all four on Shabbat. The Shema and her blessings are only said in the evening and the morning. So if you go for an afternoon service, you don't hear the Shema. And if you go for the additional service on Shabbat, you don't hear the Shema. It's only because in the Ve'ahavta it says it was you know, prayer when you, you pray when you go to bed and when you rise up, when you lie down and rise up. So because of that section, you only say the Shema and her blessings in the evening and the morning. Hmm. Rabbi, what's the history of the Shema? How far does it go back? The Shema goes all the way back to the Torah. It's in the Torah. It's in Deuteronomy, right next to the Ten Commandments. So it is a very ancient prayer. So that the Amidah, which is the centerpiece of the service, we don't know how far it goes back, at least 2,000 years. Some would say 1,500. We don't know. But the, the, the Amidah is probably what originally was the entire service. The entire service was probably that one prayer in ancient times. And we added things to the, to the back and the front of it through the years. Hmm. So the Amidah is also known as the Shemona Esrei, the Tefillah, 
Avodah Balev. So in Hebrew, it's known as the prayer standing or the 18 benedictions or the prayer of the heart, basically, or the work of the heart. So, but does everybody see this part here where there's three sections? Mm -hmm. So first of all, tell me what is wrong with this. This prayer is called the 18 benedictions. What do you notice right away is a problem? It's called the 18 benedictions. And it's 19. There's 19. For those of you not good at math, like Eva and me, 18 <laughs> and 19 are not the same number. 19 is one more than 18. So even though it's called the 18 benedictions, there are 19 prayers. So that means either a prayer was added later or possibly one of the prayers was divided into two. So it's called the 18 benedictions, but there's 19. That's always, that's always the funny irony. So this is how the prayer works. The first three parts are praising God. God, you are amazing. It is like you are buttering up God. The next 13 are asking God for stuff. I want knowledge, repentance, forgiveness, good stuff, redemption, health, agriculture, destroy my enemies, build, you know, the, you know, the Messiah comes. And then the last three are thank you prayers. Thank you, God, for giving this to me or for not giving this to me. So it's basically buttering up God, asking for something, and saying thank you whether you got it or not. Because every kid knows it's important to say thank you. Because even if you're not getting the bicycle this time, you may get it next time. Ron. Right, right, right. Okay. So far, I didn't say so far. I said so, so far. far. Um, we have two things. This one here, instead of 18, is 19. And then break the fast, it's not 24 hours, it's 25 hours. That's right. How, how many, is this common in all of the, in, in everything? Is there a lot more? Well, 25 hours, again, for Yom Kippur and for Shabbat, they're actually more than 24 hours. Because the idea is we don't want you to end these days accidentally early. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and give you an extra hour in there to make sure you get the full Shabbat in. That's yeah, what, I, Shabbat. what I meant was that uh, with the 18, which is 19, and 24 is 25, oh, are there I, any other prayers that say, uh, for instance, uh, 10, but there's 11? Or, oh, know? yeah. Sometimes they'll do that, especially in like the um the uh the 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 whatchamacallit the the uh mysticism and jewish mysticism they will say these this number ends up 24 which is only one away from 25 which is the number we're looking for so at times you will they will do that a little bit but that's a good analogy ron i didn't even think about that that's excellent i'm going to use that and give you absolutely no credit when i use that in a sermon <laughs> so this is the three sections for the Amidah during the week. During the Shabbat, you're not allowed to ask for stuff. Oh. Let me clear all this here. So, okay. so for Shabbat, you can't ask for anything, even nice stuff. Oh. So on Shabbat, we take this middle section out, mm -hmm. and you add one prayer for Shabbat. So when we go to services on Friday and Saturday, we do these three, check, Shabbat, check, and these three. So it's only seven when we go on, on Friday and Saturday. Hmm. But if we go to a week, then we will add these things back in. Is that is that everybody understand that part? All hmm. right. That was pretty cool how you did that, though. Thanks. Yes, my <laughs> Zoom skills are mm, perfect to say the least. 
So that's a little bit about how prayer works. Remember, two parts to prayer, the spiritual and the text, the Kavanon Keva. We really rely on the text to pray, even if we're not in the mood, also to connect. So we have the six-word formula for almost all prayers. Any prayer that is a commandment in the moment, putting on a talis, saying the prayer over candles on Friday night, we add the prayers for commandment, a share Kiddushan of Mitzvotah The service has a set order, but every service will have the Amidah in it. And if it don't say the Amidah, it is not a service. It is a ceremony. So again, that's why after a funeral, we go to somebody's house for minion. The idea is now we can say a service. Some believe you can only say Kaddish in a service. So we've added Kaddish to the, the funeral, but some would say you only say Kaddish in a service. That means you have to go home and have a service to say Kaddish. That's why we need minion. And you need 10 people to say Kaddish. Now, tradition in Judaism, yes, Flossie. When did it become, or maybe it just with us, a tradition of saying prayer silently, just to yourselves? <clears throat> now, in that has been a long-standing tradition. Because for the Amidah, um, a night is silent. So if you go to Orthodox or Conservative service on a Friday night and they get to the Amidah, it'll be silent. The, the head, the guy leading it will say, Baruch Atarnai, and then they'll be silent for the prayer. So the idea of saying a silent prayer, but saying anything you want is kind of a reform movement thing that we've added through the years, kind of copying what non-Jews do. Judaism traditionally is not real big on personal prayer. That's why we write all these prayers for us to use. Thank you. And traditionally, you can pray with one person, but there are a few prayers that you need 10. Traditionally, 10 men. <coughs> for us, it's 10 anybody. There's only a couple prayers. Uh, the Barhu is one of them. The Kaddish is one of them. So, But all the other prayers you can say by yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, traditionally. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Well, Rabbi, I would like to say that this class today is just wonderful. Oh, thank you, Ron. You're always so supportive. It was really Ron, nice. Rabbi, he's saying that because he did a lot of reading. He wanted to Yes. <laughs> well, because I told him ahead of time what to do. <laughs> uh, my, my fan club. <clears throat> well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shalom. Oh. Um, I originally was going to have class next week. I think I am going to cancel it. I apologize because I may, I don't know for sure, maybe going somewhere with the family. So uh, Enjoy. Well, I like to say that uh, for everybody who's listening, uh, this Saturday is, is, Can is Cantor Rachel's first uh, service. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ron, for leading me into it. So this Saturday will be Cantor Rachel's first service. Everyone's obviously invited. We'll have a nice oneg. The Saturday afterwards is our 290th anniversary. We're going to have a guest speaker. We're going to have a big luncheon. RS, please, RS, there's no cost to it, just RSVPs, because we want to know how many people are coming for lunch. So he's going to talk for a few minutes during the service, and then his presentation will be during lunch afterwards. He's a, a scholar on Sephardic history, especially the Iberian Peninsula, which obviously has a lot of, to do with our congregation, which was founded mostly by Portuguese refugees. So those are the next two Saturdays. Also, not this Friday night. This Friday night, Joe Sestino is going to be playing the guitar for us and singing. And then the next Friday, Rachel will officially start uh, leading Friday nights as well. All right. Any other announcements about things coming up? I know women of, our women of Mikveh Israel have a bunch of events coming up as well. So please stay tuned for that because they're doing so many good things. All right. Thanks, guys. I like how my shirt is doing this weird thing with the – do you guys see it or is it just me who sees it? What is it? Nice. It's the it's for coming from the sun going off the fact that my shirt has stripes. 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See how it's yeah. doing that weird thing? Nice. Yeah. All right. Very nice. And like a, it's like my superhero costume. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that, that you're, you're so fortunate that you're married to April. Yes, I am so fortunate I'm married to April. I never said otherwise. Yeah. Her, unfortunately, not so much. But I am so fortunate. So, guys, stay safe. Good to see Eva. Nice to see your face, Eva, so clearly. Eva, You're looking say, good. Hello, say hello to Paul, Eva. I to be in a, in a darkness. Sometimes yes. I could be in the darkness. I, I think it's because you're exercising more, and that's why you look so clear. Oh, yeah, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys, stay safe, Have everybody. Take care, everybody. Again, no class next week. I'll send out a note, but there will be in two weeks.